The lives that Chernobyl has impacted do not begin and end with the operators or the scientists that dominate the story. Some of these people seemed to fall in the background, considered mere bodies by the entire world, even though the work they did and the sacrifices they made brought an end to the danger of the Chernobyl catastrophe. I would like to tell the story of just one of these men, whom I have come into contact with recently and wishes to remain anonymous. We will call him Yuri. Now, Yuri, like so many, was conscripted into the military as usual. A member of the 197th Independent Chemical Defence Company, part of the 30th Guards Tank Division, it was almost entirely comprised of other men from Yuri's hometown of Zhitome, the rest from nearby villages. The Chemical Defence Company was, of course, focused on the decontamination of vehicles, particularly utility vehicles, and this would of course include radioactive material, such as in the event of a nuclear war. Of course, decontaminating radioactive vehicles is important for the safety of the occupants, and when you're in the military, possibly driving towards atomic blasts, not dying of radiation-related illnesses ranks very high in regard to safety. And naturally, this requires training. One such training exercise occurred quite far from Zhitome, far north in Estonia, one nice April. And during that exercise, on the 28th of the month, the senior lieutenant of the company saw what many regard in infamy. The senior lieutenant pulled Yuri aside shortly after and told him to warn the rest of the company for what he thought was going to be the big one, with few details, leading Yuri to speculate that something as serious as a nuclear detonation had occurred. The company was ordered to pack their bags to be ready to go in a minute's notice. A week later, they were back in Zhitome, but still not allowed to unpack their bags, as more details became obvious. And then the letter from Division Command arrived, notifying them to report to the Division's directional office within a week. They were going to Chernobyl. The men reported as instructed, and then they were sent to the airport, flown from Zhitomer to Chernigov, and then driven to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, eventually arriving at a campsite south of Pripyat. For Yuri, it was no different than other outdoor camping exercises he'd experienced during previous deployment. Except, of course, much stricter than before about places he was allowed to go to, what he could touch in the zone, and what and where he could eat. Life in the zone was, obviously, not pleasant, but the campsite was by far the better portion of it, and even then, it would be difficulty to find positivity in it all. Reading in the newspaper in the morning while eating rations, duty through the day, and in the evening, people would gather in groups as large as 20 to crowd around televisions and see what life was like away from the disaster site. Horror stories emerged of the so-called boys in lead aprons, those who were sent to the nuclear power plant's roof to clear rubble above the reactor, and how many would fall ill after succumbing to the dose they received. Many dreamed of leaving, some did and deserted their posts. Storms and floods lashed the campsite regularly, lightning even occasionally struck the area, and in one instance a stove was tipped over, destroying two tents and a truck. Board games and card games in the night were interspersed with alcohol and fights. When the liquidators took iodine, it would often make them throw up, and then they would aim for the people they disliked. Fights would ensue, and then their lieutenants would break them up and put them on extra duties the following day, ending with new friendships. As a decontamination platoon, Yuri would wake early, eat his rations with his fellow soldiers, and receive the daily briefing by the commanding officer. After a short rest period, 
They would catch a ride in either a ZIL truck for typical work or a BTR armoured transporter if they were doing special work on the territory of the nuclear power plant. Once they arrived, they would change into protective equipment and typically vehicles would be delivered to them for decontamination. Once something arrived, a dosimetrist would measure the radioactivity of the vehicle and then Yuri and his platoon would begin decontamination using a mixture of water and a potassium permanganate solution. The latter being useful for oxidising harmful particulates, so they could be removed more easily. When they were done, the dosimetrist would scan it again and, if it was decontaminated sufficiently, it would be sent back into service. Otherwise, the vehicle would be sent off, normally to Buria Kivka, where it would be buried. Yuri and his platoon weren't just confined to cleaning vehicles, however. In some cases, they were sent to decontaminate the streets of Pripyat and to hose down the liquidators sent to wash the roofs of the buildings, until they were safe to touch again, and then their clothing would be removed and buried, much like the clothes of the rooftop liquidators. Accidents still happened, of course, and they were neither happy nor little. In one instance, a BREM-1, a very large armoured recovery vehicle, ended up falling off the back of a trailer while Yuri and his platoon were trying to decontaminate it. The vehicle then impacted their equipment truck and destroyed it, making that day a lot longer than it should have been. And another story of Yuri's entwines with one we have already covered and ends a two month long mystery that even made new stories. The Chernobyl Mercedes, a vehicle whose fate has remained uncertain with no direct leads to where it had wound up. The last trace of it was in a book where the author, Piers Paul Reed, mentioned that it might have been towed away by two senior members of the KGB so the computer data could be examined. Now, we can establish that this was only from its original position immediately next to Unit 4, to the second position near the industrial site west of the nuclear power plant. And after that, we can now turn to Yuri, who explained the final fate of the vehicle. Around August 20th, the Mercedes was involved in a collision with another vehicle that put a dent in the front. At this point, it was hard not to admit that the vehicle was now just getting in the way of the construction work at Unit 4. So, that evening, the vehicle was brought to Yuri's platoon. They were already supposed to have finished for the day, and when they were told that the Mercedes had been inside the building, even fewer wanted to work with it let alone approach the rusty red vehicle. Yuri suggested that they throw it away, but they were warned that such a piece of equipment was so expensive they would make him pay for it if they did so. In the end, Yuri and two others of the ten men worked through the night in the exclusion zone, repeatedly washing down the truck and trying to get the radioactivity down to safe levels. But it was to no avail. Those few days in the turbine hall, surrounded by contaminated water and pieces of the core that fell through the roof after it collapsed, and then weeks next to the building before being finally sent for decontamination, had made it an impossible task. They tried sending it to some equipment recycling workers, but they refused to handle it either, so Yuri went with the less orthodox and much less legal option, bribery. Then their first lieutenant agreed to let them just take the vehicle and dump it, and finally head in for the night. They put the Mercedes on the trailer and drove it to Buria Kivka. The guards were scared away by the radiation levels, and Yuri reported that they were under special orders to dispose of the vehicle by themselves. The guards allowed them in, and the vehicle was dumped into Burial Site 12, an unceremonial end to a vehicle that was considered so valuable it claimed two lives, and spawned a mystery I never expected would be solved. Farewell Mercedes. Shortly after this, Yuri and his platoon's work in the exclusion zone came to an end, but his experience with Chernobyl was still not over. For two weeks, he and his platoon remained in the Radiological Institute at Kiev, where they were sent through countless medical tests to assess their health before they were finally discharged back to Zhitomir. For a year afterwards, military duty continued as normal, until Yuri's radiation exposure finally caught up with him. Over the following 38 years, Yuri has battled three different types of cancers, a total of four times, and many other illnesses. 
Still, he has three children and built a home for each of them. And, as he said in his own words, God will, I'll live long enough to witness the day when the exclusion zone is repopulated again. Yuri may be just one man who had just one experience of the Chernobyl disaster, but he also represents the hundreds of thousands who have never, and likely will never, share their stories. As I said before, Yuri has asked me not to share their identity. That is not their real name. Out of respect for the other individuals who never got the opportunity. Thank you for letting me tell your story.